Yes, so they're, they're nocturnal, they're mammals, and they echolocate for the most part. Actually, it's a very large, uh, the, the main different species of bats. And this is a, a member of Microchiroptera, which means it's small. And it's insectivorous. I'll save some more for later, but not all bats actually echolocate. There's some that are called whispering bats that just whisper, as in it's very difficult to pick up the echolocation call. And they tend to work by olfaction, that is smelling. Uh, they tend to be fruit-eating bats instead. Anyway, uh, so here's a brief outline of the talk. I'll introduce some words, buzzwords mainly, only three of them in fact. We'll talk some about acoustics and sonar. We will talk some about echolocation. And then, uh, so I say primer to neuroscience, really I don't go into much depth at all. We can go into more depth if you're interested. And so in that sense, I want the talk to be such that you can interrupt at any moment. If I say something that's very unclear, uh, or you'd like me to go into more depth. There are questions at the end, but if it waits for that long and if you don't have pen and paper, you'll probably forget. And so I think it'd be more meaningful if you interrupt as needed. Uh, so reversing biological systems, that's the theme, actually. I don't have slides to that end, but we'll talk a bit more as I go. It's sort of a pervasive aura of the presentation. And then I'll talk some about studying the sonar beam of bats. Cute words. So has any, everyone seen these words before? Yeah, biomimetic. So the idea with biomimetic is that there's something that mimics a biological system, uh, even at the cost of some suboptimality of the system. So to be clear, optimality is defined with respect to some, some criterion. For example, we want to minimize power consumption, we want to minimize weight, or we want to maximize flight time, a variety of parameters, and so you optimize with respect to those. Biomimetic doesn't seek to do that, it seeks to mimic the biological system. An example project is the robotic Samara. I might not be pronouncing that correctly. It's a type of seed that has a wing on it, a single blade. I'm sure you've seen them outside before. They fall from a tree and spin. And land. Does everyone know those? You can pick them up and make them do it again. Uh, there's a group at the University of Maryland that found out the physics involved in that and then made a robotic imp implementation. So it's a single blade helicopter. We could look at videos after the talk if you're interested. And I have links and so on. Uh, Bioplausible is something that could in principle be implemented in a biological system, but not necessarily. Uh, this word is a bit abused. It's abused because when people think of something being parallel and requiring small computational units, they think that, well, it can be implemented in a biological system. That's not necessarily the case, uh, but still that's the meaning of this word, something that might be implemented in some biological system. Usually these, this work is modeled by or with or through some existing system. The example I give is visual stabilization uh, for flight, inspired by or guided by uh, vision models of the fruit fly, Drosophila. Does everyone know fruit flies? Very small, they pop up all over the place where there's fruit. And uh, bio-inspired. So it's work, this is similar to biomimetic, as in you're building something that's similar to the system, but you're trying to make it better. So uh, an example uh, I give here is gecko foot adhesive, which is a project at Berkeley. Uh, geckos can walk on walls and a variety of other places very easily. So there's a group there that studied that in geckos, but in particular attempted to extend it and implement it in a, a synthetic material. And they've had fairly good success. Acoustics. Could I see raise of hands or clap or thumbs up if you know Fourier, Fourier transforms Fourier series? Oh, very good. Okay. So the basic idea for those who don't is you're given some signal or some waveform, and you want to express it in terms of sinusoids. A sinusoid, and so I don't have a laser pointer, so I'm gonna use the mouse, which doesn't show up. So the top row, so our reference, the signal that we want to describe is this blue rectangle wave. You can begin by finding a sinusoid of a particular frequency, a low frequency, that's very similar to it. Of course, that's a fairly poor approximation. We can add another sinusoid, which is the next row, and we get a little better. And you can continue to add sinusoids until you get a very good approximation to the signal. 
Uh, is that clear so far? Okay. And that's significant because given some arbitrary signal, you can talk about spectral content. That is, I can give you, I could snap and you could record it and decompose it into these sinusoids. Well, more accurately, the Fourier transform has a continuous definition of frequency, but you, you get a sense of spectral content. Uh, clicks are special, or snaps are special, because they have fairly high frequency content, even though you might not think so, because it's so sudden. Uh, it's because it requires a large number of sinusoids, you can think intuitively, to represent that very sharp peak in intensity. So let's look at some examples. Uh, only two, actually. This is a sinusoid, a tone frequency. It's 100 hertz. The equation at the top, so sine 2 times pi times t, which is time, times 100, which gives us the 100 hertz. Uh, the axes are, the axis labels are small, so I'll tell you about them. That's peak to peak of 2, and the time range you see is from 0 to 30 milliseconds. So 100 hertz, that means every cycle completes in 10 milliseconds. So when we're given some signal, we want to visualize it. And there are a variety of ways to do it. This is, you could say this is a general problem with studying data. How do we look at it? And one way to look at acoustic data is something called a spectrogram, which shows frequency content with respect to time. That is, on the x-axis, we have time. On the y-axis, we have frequency. And the colors indicate intensity. So red would be more intense, blue is zero, or very low. And so from that tone frequency that we just looked at, which is 100 hertz, we get this spectrogram, which is a solid bar at 100. So over time, it's, it's always 100 hertz, a constant frequency. With a more complicated function like this one, where we're decreasing the frequency at an exponentially increasing rate, uh, it's not obvious what we're looking at. So it's a constant amplitude, and we can see that from this plot. But when you look at it here, and this, some, of this, some of the shape here is an artifact of the rendering uh, program, GNU plot. But you, when you look at it, it's not obvious what the content is. And this is a good example because when you're recording something, some sound, or, s or it doesn't have to be sound, but anything where you're interested in the frequency content, you might not be able to understand it just by looking at the time waveform. By time waveform, I mean the horizontal axis is time, vertical axis, intensity. But if we look at the spectrogram, it becomes much more clear what's happening. So x-axis is time, y-axis is frequency again, and now we can see the peak frequency content is decreasing exponentially. Does everyone feel good about that? If you look at plots of voices, human speech, which I don't have any slides on that. If you're interested, we can do it after the talk together uh, or otherwise. There are harmonics. We'll get to see a harmonic when we look at a bat vocalization, but there's much more rich structure than this. These are contrived examples to make the point. And just as a side note, another way you'll see these represented often is with the logarithmic axis. That means for every step on the y-axis, there's a change in order of magnitude. That's done because in the cochlea, the human cochlea and most mammalian cochlea, the frequency distribution is logarithmic. So, fun fact. Okay, so sonar. Well, how does everyone feel about acoustics so far? We just barely touched on it. I didn't mention this, something very fundamental that I assumed you would know. Sound is a pressure wave. So when I'm talking right now, I'm causing compressions and rarefactions in the air. That's picked up by a microphone, which is actually, depending on the construction, moving with the pressures, the pressure changes. Okay, that's picked up by a coil. Again, depending on the construction. Uh, so sonar, what we want to do is detect something in the field, in the field being in space. And the, this is a basic construction of it. I emit some sound, I wait for some time, and I get something back. Now, it's important to note this is continuous, as in, as I'm talking now, my sounds that I'm generating are coming out of my mouth. If you were to visualize it, it's like this string that's coming out. And when I stop, it propagates through space. Okay. And when it comes back, I get the front of it, the so-called wave front, and then the rest follows in, like spaghetti, if we're staying with the string analogy. 
Uh, so let t be time, s is the emitted signal, r is what's received. A simplification usually is to assume that what you're getting back is a delayed copy of what you sent out. That's not true because the visual scene is much more rich than this. But to a fair approximation, we let that be the case. Uh, so we know the speed of sound, roughly. And a decent approximation to getting distance is to see this delay. Uh, so I wrote the equation a bit strange uh, here. So k is this time delay. k is the time delay. It's the flight time from when I emitted to when something came back. And k is related to distance and the speed of sound by k equals 2d over c. Distance d is the distance between me and the thing that I'm vocalizing on. So 2d because there's trip there, trip back. OK. Uh, so how do we detect it when it's coming back? Not so simple. A general approach is something called cross-correlation. Does everyone or anyone know cross-correlation? Yep. So you're given some signal. And so I don't have many graphs for this. I avoided writing equations as much as possible just to try to get some intuition. And we'll look at a plot soon. But the basic idea with cross-correlation is you're given some function. We can, you can think of my hand as that function. And we're given some other function, which looks different. Cross-correlation is when you look at them together and multiply them by each other. So for example, the cross-correlation function is a function of time. If we begin at zero time, which means zero time difference, we align these two and integrate them. We multiply them and integrate over that. The result is something, some particular value. And you can repeat this at different delays, which means you're, you're, sl you're effectively sliding one function across another. And you're getting these values out. So intuitively, when they're aligned, if they were the same, well, so if this was the other shape, when we get to a perfect alignment and then multiply them in effect and then integrate, we get a fairly large value. So the idea then intuitively is cross-correlation is a way to pick out similarness given two functions. So here's an example. Uh, x-axis is time. On the left, we see time waveforms, that is, some energy, intensity, whatever you'd like to call the y-axis, with respect to time. On the right is the uh, cross-correlation. So first we have this tone frequency that's on at two seconds and ends a little after three seconds. Uh, in the top left, there's zero noise. And you can tell that because the line is flat aside from that, that rectangle burst. Is that clear? And then the next, so on the right then we see this cross-correlation function. It has a triangular shape. That's because of this, this shifting that's happening. As we're getting more and more aligned, there's a, a linear increase in the sum. Don't worry about that so much as the fact that there's a peak and it's fairly obvious. Uh, the peak happens to be at two seconds or fairly close to it, which means that we know using a reference signal, this is two seconds is when that sound occurred. I didn't show it here, but I used a reference signal, an exact copy of the, the rectangle wave at time zero. So in the context of a sonar system, that means I emit something and I know what it should look like. I have a copy. After all, I emitted it. And so when I'm receiving something back, as I'm receiving it, I can cross-correlate what's coming in with this original signal that I emitted. We should get a peak if there's a very good match. The second row has a little bit more noise. Uh, so th the top row has a peak amplitude of 5. The original signal, rather, has a peak amplitude of 5. The second row has noise of 1, variance 1. It's Gaussian noise. This is what you might see if you actually had an electrical system. If you look at the wire, there's background noise, it might be called. Uh, so you can still just visually see the rectangle. Uh, and if we look on the right, the excuse me, the cross correlation shows the result, and it's we see the peak again. However, for the last example, uh, there's variance of 10 in the noise, which means it's very difficult. As in, when you look at this visually, you, I suspect you cannot see the rectangle wave itself. If you can, you should interrupt me. Uh, but on the right, the, cr the cross correlation is fairly clear. This is a contrived example because we're assuming Gaussian noise, which means it's zero mean. It's fairly straightforward to get rid of when you're averaging. But I think the point still stands. You can pull out a signal out of what just looks like background noise. 
That's important from a sonar viewpoint because when, you're s when I emit something, it has spreading loss. So you can think of two primary sources of loss. There's spreading loss, which means I emit something at a point and it spreads outward. So spreading loss. Atmospheric attenuation has to do with absorption of, of the sound by the air and it's frequency dependent. Uh, so sonar is not just distance, we're also interested in direction. As a human, we use some, th we, we have our ears, right, and we have two of them. And it's not enough to have two ears, we also have this structure around the ears, and that's called a pinna. I might be pronouncing it incorrectly, but that's the word, at least that's how it's spelled on the slide. Uh, does anyone know what a head-related transfer function is? So. I'll try to build some intuition. When you, when there's a sound, so if I snap, right, when I do this at different points in space, what's received, you can't hear it, so I'm not gonna do it that way, but when it's received in my eardrum, it changes, actually, depending on where it came from. You can measure this precisely and get what's called a head-related transfer function, which is a function, essentially, that given some point in space, and so, by that, I mean there's azimuth and elevation. Given some point and the sound, I know what it looks like when it hits my eardrum. It turns out you can measure this for a, a person and you can actually develop software that accounts for it and so you can get surround sound even better uh, with just two headphones. But you might wonder, and this is just a side note, why didn't that happen? Why do we have surround sound systems? Why is there not a big market for HRTFs? The answer is, it depends on you, what your HRTF is. If you have lots of piercings in your ear, it's going to be different for you. If you have ear, well, essentially ear shape affects it, hair, head, shoulders, so all those things account for it. And you learn your own HRTF, you as the human, and animals, mammals do, too. Uh, so that's why there hasn't been such a big market, because it's hard to find it and difficult to measure. So here are some more bats. This is the same bat, actually. And now, this is the original picture that you saw at the beginning, of the beginning of the presentation, but now you see the bat is vocalizing at something. Does everyone see that its mouth is open? This is what you would see for this species if it was flying around. Actually, you would see it opening and closing its mouth as it flew, and like that, right? You wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to hear something until you reach certain points of, the, uh, of flight. We'll talk about that in a moment. So this bat is vocalizing at this thing that's covered in felt, black felt. Can everyone see it on the right side of the uh, slide? It was trained to do that for an experiment. And, and so now this is just a, a for fun photo of it doing it. Now it's flying over it. It's looking also there. Uh, I'll take this moment to say, for those who don't know, bats' wings are their hands. In fact, Chiroptera, and my biology is weak, but I believe that means family, or that, that's the family or organization for them, means wing hand. Uh, and in this photo, you can see the bat's hand fairly clearly, as in you can see, I'll try to make my arm look like it. There's the elbow up to the hand, you can see the thumb, which you, you don't see any photos of this here, I can show you them after the talk. That's used by the bat to grip on things when it's walking, or doing other tasks. Uh, and then the wings, of course, are built up by the digits extending out. And so the bat is not trying to have sex with this. It is trying to scoop up what it was trained to think of as a target. This bat has a tail membrane. Can everyone see the tail membrane? It should be more obvious in this photo. In the bottom, uh, bottom left, you can see the bat's foot which are, the feet are surprisingly small, don't have much function in this species. Uh, and there's a tail, and there's, a, there's skin in between. When this bat catches an insect, it's often the case that it's difficult to catch an insect in its mouth because its mouth is so small. So it catches insects by hitting them with the wings or scooping them up with the tail. In this case, it's trying to scoop up the target, which is why it's making that motion. So now I'll show you uh, a brief video. Uh, in experimental context, when you want to study something, you want it to be controlled. You want to control for variation. And 
for bats, we have a room, we as in at this lab in Maryland, where the walls have padding to reduce echo, fairly standard issue in for anyone who's doing acoustics work. Uh, we also have a video tracking system to track the position of the bat. That is, we need to know with fairly high resolution where the bat is in space as it's flying at any moment in time. So on the left, you should be able to see, there we go. There's a bat flying through a room. In fact, I'm in the bottom right portion of that raw video. Uh, can everyone see the bat? And on the right is the position that's tracked by the video system. So the gray pillars are these artificial trees we set up. They're not really trees, they're just columns of net that the bat likes to avoid because when it runs into them, it gets tangled or otherwise doesn't feel good. Uh, the magenta shape is a net that you cannot see so easily from the raw video, but it's, it's put up to prevent the bat from circling around the forest, the forest of artificial trees. Uh, so when we have this position information, then we can ask questions about what's happening at that point in space, that is, where the, the emitter is, that is, the bat, as it's flying. Uh, this is a an example vocalization by the bat, an echolocation call. We say it's an echolocation call as opposed to a social call because it's in a room with no other bats. Uh, this is the time waveform. That is x-axis is time, horizontal axis is intensity measured at a microphone on the floor. So when you look at this, you might try to make statements about the structure, but it's very difficult to, I claim. So here's a spectrogram of it. And now we can see the structure that was in that, that was not so obvious. Uh, again, red corresponds to greater intensity, blue is lower. And the y-axis here is different than we saw before because it's ultrasonic range. So the, if it's difficult to read for you, I'll help you. The lower one, zero, 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 zero is 10 kilohertz. And this plot goes up to about 92 kilohertz. And so there's what's called a fundamental sweep which is the lower red structure. Again, y -ax excuse me, uh, horizontal axis is time. This is about four milliseconds. Uh, the call begins at about 68 kilohertz and sweeps down to just below 30 kilohertz. That's the fundamental. You can also see what's called a harmonic, which is the structure above, it, above the fundamental. Is that clear to everyone? A harmonic, by definition, is a multiple in frequency of some other signal. So ha harmonic of 100 hertz is 200 hertz. Harmonics are what make music beautiful, for example. Well, they contribute to the beauty of music. Tone frequencies are not so pleasant to hear. Anyway, this bed has a sweep. It's called a frequency sweep or a chirp. However, so we see that, but the shape of the chirp, the vocalization structure, depends on what the bat's doing. And so if we're interested in building little robots that can fly around and track something, we should know what the bat does when it's tracking. And the full tracking process is called an attack sequence. The call structure actually changes throughout the sequence. In this plot, which is taken from a, a paper, you can see different call shapes. So as we move from the top to the bottom, we're going essentially from search in the open field to just before attack, or rather just before capture. Uh, the numbers on the left, the large numbers, are milliseconds, it's duration of the call. Uh, left column is time waveform, center column is spectrogram, right column is what's called just a spectrum, magnitude plot. It shows energy across frequency for the whole call. Uh, so the lesson of it, if you move down the middle column, you can see that the, the bet begins with not much frequency modulation. That is, the spectrogram, again, I don't have a pointer, so just if it's unclear, interrupt me and I can, I can change the presentation mode and point with the mouse. Uh, but the, in the middle column, the topmost plot is fairly flat, which means the bat is not modulating its frequency that much. And also, it's a fairly low frequency. So we can try to rationalize this or understand it by noting that 
and I didn't tell you this earlier, so you wouldn't note it, but now we're noting it. Atmospheric attenuation depends on frequency, and as you go up in frequency, the attenu attenuation increases, which means the 65 kilohertz is going to be absorbed by the atmosphere a lot more than 30 kilohertz. Uh, and so, so that's one reason why we might suspect the bat has a fairly constant frequency emission at search. And it's long and constant, which means there's a lot of energy in a particular frequency. The argument there is it's easier to detect something. So if I'm in a room and I have nothing except a small sonar system, the best way to detect something, detection, as in I want to know if something's there, not necessarily where it is, is to send out as much energy as possible intuitively. And then if there's something there, whatever size it might happen to be, I'll get an echo back. Okay. As we move down, the call changes, call shape changes, moving down the middle column. We can see it gets shorter, and there be begins to be more high frequency content, and the harmonics begin to appear. The argument for this is as the bat begins to find, or has found a target, and is now tracking it, approaching it, it knows that there is something there, and it's fairly close to it, and so what it's trying to do is find out where it is. It's trying to improve the resolution. So in sonar, that would correspond to increased frequency. So that's why we begin to see spectral content up to 60, 70 kilohertz. Yep. No, so an interesting question, but it, the bat vocal structure is very similar, if not the same, as ours in basic structure. The harmonic, I don't know. I'm not sure that it is well understood. But if it is, I know which books to look in to try to answer that question. But I don't know. Because uh, there, there are actually species of bats that can focus or defocus energy in different harmonics. So uh, there might be something more. In this species, though, to my knowledge, they don't have that, uh, that control. So uh, and then at the end, toward the bottom, the pulses are about 1.1 millisecond long. So that is to say if, well, to give you some intuition, a one kilohertz tone has a period of one millisecond. So these entire calls span only one millisecond. So this is how quickly the bat's generating these calls as it's approaching something. Uh, and as there's more high frequency content, which is further expanded because of the harmonics, there's also lower frequency content. As in, there's a, there's a shift, and I'll try to give you the intuition with my arm, in this direction. And if you stand near a bat when it's catching an insect, you can actually hear a buzz, which has a sound like this. It doesn't go up. Mine went up a bit, but uh, it's called the terminal buzz. Before echolocation was discovered, that's what scientists would hear. But they didn't know how to explain it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we'll get to hear a recording that's slowed down by a factor of 10. <laughs> yeah. We'll look at the recording in a bit. A few more slides. Uh, so neuroscience. We're not going to talk much about it, but the science of the nervous system. Uh, bats are mammals, which means in many respects they're similar to us, which is why they're such an interesting model. Well, that's part of the reason why. They're similar, but they can fly. They echolocate. In fact, their primary system is audition. That is, whereas we in primates are vision heavy, and we have lots of, lots of parts of our nervous system that have visual responses, bats are different in that they have acoustic responses. Uh, but so more generally, what I come across, at least insofar as open source hardware and in the hacker community, there's more of a fixation on EEG and non-invasive techniques, which is understandable because in humans, you generally cannot be invasive for recordings. By invasive, I mean if I stick a wire in someone's head, that's invasive. But if I put a pad over the scalp, EEG, MEG, that's not invasive. The problem with these, what I call population recordings, is that you're picking up the activity of an extremely large number of neurons. And it isn't clear that that's the level at which computation happens. And most significant results in neuroscience happen in animals where you actually do in these invasive recordings. As a side note, you can actually have invasive recordings in humans, 
typically in the context of epileptic, epileptic patients who are having something done anyway, if we're trying to localize a source of what might be the start of a seizure, in some cases you can get these patients to agree to have electrical recordings done while you're doing the surgery. Uh, so there is, interestingly, that, that data. So there's much more, th the main message of this is that there's much more than these population recordings that are external to the body. You can look at extracellular activity, which means you have a, a wire or some other type of electrode in the nervous, or in the nerve tissue, in the brain tissue rather, and it's near neurons, and the neurons are spiking. And you can pick up on it. How many people know what a neuron is? or at least have had sketches of explanations? Yeah, sketches of explanations, maybe. Um, well, the basic idea, I'm going to touch on it for those who don't know. Your nervous system has a lot of neurons. It also has other things in it, called glial cells that support the neurons uh, and other stuff. But neurons tend, well, we tend to think that neurons are the, the seat of computation. If we're ever going to find consciousness or other magical words like that, there will be somewhere in the neur neurons, in their structure. Neurons are typically organized by a soma, a body, which has the, the nucleus, classic cell structure, animal cell structure. Dendrites, so in the top left of this figure, you can see a lot of things webbing out. And those are called the dendrites. They receive input from other neurons. And again, I'm speaking at a high level, it turns out it's very hard to be much more precise than this. Neuroscience is a fairly young field. Uh, but there's some kind of integration happening, as in the neuron picks up this activity from other neurons in its dendrites. Uh, if you look in this figure, the soma has a purplish color. Now, this isn't made to be biologically correct. It's just done, th the color scheme is done to be more clear. Attached to the dendrites, you can see these bluish purple things. Those are axons from other neurons. And so this neuron has an axon that comes out. It's covered by that orange material. And what that does is it speeds up transmission. It makes the transmission mostly electrical. Uh, we can talk more about that in a moment. And then this, this axon goes on, and it goes on to touch other neurons. And there's things called synapses. Maybe you've heard about them. When you do drugs, typically it's in this synapse where activity happens. So there's chemical transmission between an axon of one neuron, dendrite of another, and serotonin, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, antidepressants, that's a class of antidepressants, selectively inhibit the uptake of serotonin in these synapses, and then the effect is people tend to be happier uh, with other side effects. And so that's a sketch of the neuron. I showed you this, and I spent just a moment on it to try to, to convince you that there's potentially lots of richness here. We know the richness because that's when you have a drug or when there's something affecting your nervous system, it's happening at this level, at the neuron level. And so if we're going to try to understand the nervous system or biological systems, we need to go down to a fairly basic unit. I propose it's the neuron or something close. You can also do something called intracellular recordings. Uh, that's where you actually have a, a pipette or an electrode where you stick it on the surface of the neuron and you pull off some of the membrane. And then you can actually record intracell inside the cell. So it's, it's extremely difficult to do, but you can get extremely good recordings. Uh, they're good because I didn't mention this before. And again, please interrupt me when things are clear or seem understated. All this integration that's happening at the dendrites, supposedly, is encoded in spikes. So there's some threshold. And when the potential across the membrane goes above some threshold, the neuron spikes. And when you stick an electrode, so if you cut a fruit fly, if you let out a banana in this conference and then came back tomorrow and got the fruit flies, you could actually record from them. And if you were recording their neural activity, you would see spikes, extracellular. That's if you stick an electrode near a neuron, the, the strongest electrical activity is the spiking. If you do intracellular recording, then you can actually pick up, excuse me, pick up what's called intracellular, excuse me, sub-threshold activity, sub the threshold of spiking. And you can't do any of this with, with non-invasive imaging techniques, so fMRI, you're just 
you're outside the brain, you're picking up gross levels of activity. Uh, we could talk more about that if you're interested during questions or now. So a bat brain is very small. Bats are small, their brains are smaller. The scale, the scale bar in this plot is five millimeters. We're looking at the top view of a bat's brain. So its mouth would be on the left side of this figure. Its back and body would be to the right. Uh, and I show you this just to give you, well, we're not going to draw much benefit from this aside from you seeing the gross structure. There's the SC and the IC, those are the superior colliculus and the uh, inferior colliculus. As mammals, we have them too, but in humans, we have a huge cortex, and it sits on top of the brainstem and other brain areas. But in bats, conveniently, there's not as much cortex, and the IC and the SC are exposed. I mention those because they have fairly interesting behavior. For example, you can find neurons in IC that are what are, what are called echo delay tuned. As in, if you have a bat, and you have an electrode in its IC at some level, and you play to the bat a vocalization, a pre-recorded vocalization even, one of those that I showed you earlier, you'll see some, well you won't see activity actually, you might see activity for certain types, but for echo delay tuning, or echo delay tuned neurons, you won't see the activity until you have an echo at a particular delay. And in fact, these neurons will fire or spike more often depending on the delay. And this is interesting because already we see some manifestation of range measurement. As in if you had a, a population of these neurons that are delayed to echo, excuse me, tuned to echo delay, you could find out or measure which ones are firing and get some sense of distance. Is that clear, that basic process? And you can also find neurons that are selective to azimuth and elevation, that is direction. And so when you combine them all, you already have a spatial view, acoustic spatial view. So one moment, look at the time, okay. Uh, so the, the bat's vocalizing. You saw a time waveform, you looked at a spectrogram, but that isn't enough. If you have, if I had a speaker in front of you, typically it would have a piston operation. We could think of it as a piston, a piston being a cylinder that moves like this. It moves the air in a particular way and you can model it fairly well. But humans and bats and other animals don't have such a trivial shape to the way they generate sound. Uh, which is why it might be interesting to study the sonar beam. I say it might because we don't know, and I'll, I'll touch on some work here. But the sonar beam refers to if we took a picture, so if we picked a particular frequency and a particular time, we could get some idea of shape of what the bat emitted. So previous work, uh, so it's a difficult problem because bats are flying. Animals, and if they're not flying, or if they're what, are call what is called head fixed, as in the head is fixed in place by something that's cemented to the skull, the bats don't want to do anything. Maybe that's not surprising. Uh, the closest we can get to a bat not flying and vocalizing is what are called platform experiments, where you train the bat to remain on a platform and do something, vocalize out in a space, make a decision. For example, there's a whole paradigm of these Experiments called two alternative force choice where the animal is forced to make a choice. Forced in the sense that if it gets off the platform then that, that doesn't count as a trial but it must indicate, for example, from this direction the delay was shorter than this direction. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so earlier work, beam shape of elicited calls that I wrote here, in a head fixed animal, these people or these scientists whatever, uh, stimulated the brainstem of the bats and were able to elicit vocalizations. The problem with this study is those are s synthetic in the sense that the bat wasn't vocalizing naturally, it was vocalizing because someone was putting current through some part of its brainstem and didn't really know what was going on. It just so happens the vocalizations come out. Uh -huh. So later work is with bats that are freely flying. It's not, it doesn't include any neural work because it's Currently, the electronics don't exist to record from a bat that's flying freely. The electronics for the neural system. There's some work to do that, but it isn't widespread yet, as in it's just in some lab and they're not really sharing it. Not with bats, but with another animal. Ah. And so, anyway, this earlier work, so for example, 
in an array I'll talk about in a moment, uh, a previous researcher found that there are two lobes. So if I put a piston in space and I'm emitting a tone from it, it has a typical structure of one big lobe. And this is what you would see with ultrasonic rangefinder, for example, simple sonar devices that have this piston shape. And they'll be side lobes, but they're small. Uh, but this person found for the bat, when it's vocalizing, it has the forward beam. Th these were fairly gross measurements. There wasn't much precision in the shape, but there's a gross beam, and there's one that comes downward. So from a side view, that means when I vocalize out, there's a primary beam, and there's one below, aimed downward. And so then we un might ask, why does the bat have that? And the simple answer is we don't know. One idea might be that the bat can use it when it vocalizes to both vocalize ahead for tracking insects or targets, and it can use the slower sound to get more energy to come from the floor or the, the ground to get a sense of altitude. Uh, and there's other work involving tracking. So when you have the arrays set up that we'll talk about in a moment, you can look where the most energy is directed in the vocalizations and get a sense of where the bat's looking. Again, that'll be more clear in a moment. And I'll skip the last off-axis aim. We'll, I'll go back to it. I don't think it's so clear what I'm saying without pictures. But the pictures will come soon. So microphone arrays. If you want to measure a, s a sound, if you have a, a point in space that is a microphone, you're not going to get any sense of shape. And so there's this thing called a microphone array, which is an array of microphones, as in you're sampling the sound field in space. Uh, the previous work to do that with freely flying bats was an array that just had a fairly simple electronics. The basic idea is a band pass filter centered at 35 kilohertz. It's fairly tight, which means you're primarily seeing energy at 35 kilohertz. Uh, and so in case anyone didn't know, human hearing is up to about 20 kilohertz. It goes down as you get older. Uh, And so with this work, or with that, that array, which is a, one of the first, if not the first, uh, for bats, that's how this, this researcher showed that there are these two lobes. And you're able to study tracking now, because you, you get, when you construct a horizontal array, so if, if, if I'm sketching out a room and you're looking down on it, a horizontal array means that microphones go around the room. And when a bat's flying around the room, you can see which direction the bat's vocalizing. And I'm going to skip ahead to show you the video just to keep everyone interested. Let's start it over. Or not. Let's wait till the end and then go again. So there's a bat moving through this field. We're looking down on a room. The large circles with black dots in the center are those artificial trees that I showed you before. The magenta line is that net that prevents the bat from circling around the forest. Since we're looking down on it, it just looks like a line, but again, it's a sheet. And the blue circles that are around the perimeter are the microphones in this array. And so the blue trace, if you didn't guess it already, is the bat's flight path. The blue circle is where the bat is at the moment. Uh, this video is shown at a rate that's a factor of 10 lower than what actually happened. Good. The greenish diamond is where the microphone is on the floor that's used as a reference. So the array is only picks up energy near 35 kilohertz. You don't get actually a full shape of a call with time. The green microphone, or the green point, shows where a microphone is that would show you where you could pick up a full band. As when I showed you an example call earlier, that was a wide band recording. There's no filtering to happen. Well, there's filtering to present, prevent something called aliasing, but yeah. Is that good? What units? Time. So one second in this recording corresponds to 100 milliseconds. It is the actual sound. And so when you slow it down by a factor of 10, then all the frequencies effectively shift down. You can see this effect if you play back a tape at a higher rate. Everyone sounds like chipmunks. If you play it back slower, people sound like 
something deep. How big is the room? Mm, that's a good. So I, I could look it up. I'm going to say on the order of four meters, five meters. That's a good point, because when you look at this, you don't have a sense of scale. So the bats are small. I said they can't carry electronics earlier. I didn't tell you how much they weigh or how big they are. This species is about 15 grams, typically. Grams. You could crush it in your hand. You shouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but you can hold it in your hand. So what I, in the, in the experimental work, when you hold a bat, you can cup the entire bat in your hand fairly easily. Uh, and that's, it's worth noting these are called big brown bats, as in they get smaller. Uh, by contrast, there are fruit bats, which are big. There's one called a flying fox, because it's about as big as a fox, but it flies. <laughs> but not, they're not in the New England area, or in America. Uh, so we can get the precise measurements of the room later, but for now, just about four, five meters each direction. And so each of these chirps corresponds to some vocalization out in the array. Yeah, it, it's hard to get it to stop on one of the vocalizations here. Um, th there's more precise data than this. This is a video for show. Uh, but we know the precise vocalization times. We know how much energy was picked up at each of the microphones. And that's why we can get this, this gradient of color that you saw. So when you look there, you, you see different levels of darkness. The darker it is, the more energy there was in that direction. And the result is we can see where the bat's looking. That's a good question. <laughs> it's <laughs> so this is a, an interesting problem. And going back to, excuse me, why did the bat go? Here. It'll be easier if I show this the image as well. Why did the bat go through these two trees? More generally, why does it follow this path? Open question. Uh, there's a study that I referred to very briefly is one, and if there's a whole group of studies with it, it, it uh, studying, excuse me, <laughs> the tracking of prey by the bat, evasive prey. So there was a collection of studies in this lab where there was a praying mantis let loose in the room and the bat would fly after it and capture it. And it turns out you can model that pursuit behavior fairly elegantly in this, uh, what's just called a prey pursuit law. I don't have any slides and I don't have a whiteboard, we could talk about it after the talk. Uh, but so in some cases, you can model this behavior fairly well. By model it well, I mean you have some mathematical model of what's happening, it's a sync, some kind of what's called a control law, something that could be implemented in a robotic platform, for example. Uh, in the military context, it would be missiles. I'd like to think you can more efficiently deliver food packets <laughs> for tracking, evasive. I'm not sure why they'd be evasive, but. Uh, the so in some cases you can model the path and you can explain it well in the sense that this model this control law yields some path on simulated data that correlates very well with the experimental data in this case this is a collection of data that isn't hasn't been analyzed that much uh, but it could be this was one of the, the first studies in which the bat so with this particular setup of equipment, with this microphone array, one of the first where the bat's flying through a forest like this. And it's just waiting to be modeled, but we don't know yet why the bat chooses this particular path. This is a general problem in robotics, navigating through an obstacle field, the variety of solutions. Uh, does anyone have that background, robotics, navigation? So, okay. I won't go into those for the sake of time, but... Okay, so we'll try to wrap up. It's an interesting, interesting question, and that's the nature of this work. When, you do, when you're studying a biological system, you don't know, right? Without trying to go into religion, it's just this system there that exists, and we're trying to understand it, and you're trying to understand it, or I'm trying to understand it for its own sake, but I also think you can gain something. So in the case of that evasive law, that prey pursuit law, there's now a simple control law that can be used to, to manage some kind of aerial vehicle.
So this array was limited. Uh, there's been some work to create what are called wideband arrays, ones that are not limited, limited to 35 kilohertz, but cover a fairly large ultrasonic band. But they're limited because it's a difficult problem. It's a difficult problem because if you're going to record up to 100 kilohertz by the requirements of the Nyquist rate, that means you need to be sampling at about 200 at least, 200 samples per second per channel. What's more is if you have 10 to 16 bit sample width, that means you're generating a lot of data very quickly. And what's more is it's distributed around a room, a flight room, for example. And so my work was to pick up work by a postdoc in the lab to construct such an array. And we've had fairly good success. Since there isn't much time, I won't dwell on it for long. Essentially, there are little microcontrollers. It's a PIC family. It's a special one called the DSPIC 33F. It's called DS because it has, it has some DSP hardware on board. That means it can do multiplication in a single clock cycle and so on. Uh, these can be battery powered or powered by a, a wall adapter. There are four channels per board. They, they have SRAM built on so they can record at the high speeds required. They sampled about 260,000 samples per second. And the result is written to a, an SD card. So this is my attempt to address that problem of wideband array. And we have 28 built. The system is designed to scale even more. It's made in such a way that you can put these nodes anywhere in the room. They can receive an external trigger, a TTL pulse it's called. Well, it is a TTL pulse. and that allows you to synchronize all of them. Yeah, I won't go into much more depth. But there's software associated with it for analyzing across array microphones. It's not done yet. I'm finishing up the project, and I'm going to try to make it open access, open source, freely available. Even if we're not doing ultrasonic work, I think this, this work involving a large array of microphones is interesting. Some of the code could be used. Uh, or the amplifier or electronics design. So it's not open yet. It will be soon, working on it. And so there's analysis software as well. Uh, essentially, there's a bad, these magenta beams, or vectors, are scaled according to intensity in a particular band that you can select. Again, it's a wideband recording, which means you can freely focus on parts of the spectrum. And we get some sort of shape. This is an intensity plot with respect to azimuth and ele elevation. Uh, essentially, at the center is where this target is. You might recall at the beginning of the presentation, I mentioned there was an experiment where the bat was trained to vocalize or attack a, a, a fake thing, a, a pole. Uh, this is that data. On the opposing wall was the array of microphones, an, an array of microphones. There were just 16 on the wall. And so here we see that the bat is actually vocalizing off to the side, not directly at the target. Again, the origin is at the center of the plot. Uh, and so we could talk more about that. One theory to explain that, or one hypothesis, is that when you have a, a beam of energy, if you focus it on something, on a target, it's easier to see if it's there. Recall that I said the more energy directed at something, the more easily you'll get a response back. If you have a beam directed off target, so here's a target, here's the beam axis, beam being the most intense direction. If you get this other part of the beam around the target, it's the case that for small changes in direction, small changes in degree or angle, there's a greater change in intensity of the returned echo, which means it's easier to localize something. By localize, I mean if my eyes are closed and I'm trying to find out where I'm snapping, localizing is finding that out localizing the source. And so the idea here is simply that the bat is vocalizing off, away from the target, because it has sharper changes, steeper slope, however you want to think of it, off of it, off the main axis. So, And that's the, the summary, the end. In conclusion, biological systems are rich. You should consider them in your work. They're rich for inspiration for electronics. And I hope you are stepping away with some interest also in bat echolocation, nervous system, acoustics, but if not, certainly in the, the rich potential for ideas from the world around you. Thank you.
and I don't think we have much time, but I welcome questions. If not, just find me anywhere after this. Okay, so and I can't see because there are bright lights in my eyes, but if you snap, that will be a sign. <laughs> Let's get the lights back on. Here. Oh, okay. Um, if you could repeat the question, because then the cameras will pick it up. Okay, so yes. Yes. <laughs> I know exactly what you mean. Yes. And so the studies, this study that I'm referring to here the, is a non-invasive. And you can get a lot of information when you have a, a rich array of microphones. Oh, I didn't repeat the question. Sorry. The question was, if this hardware is made more freely available, the hardware, software, and so on, analysis tools, could that reduce the extent to which invasive techniques are used? And the answer is yes. As non-invasive techniques become richer, simply put, there's no need to be invasive. Uh, there are ethical issues, and it's ethical expense, regulatory issues that come up. So for this array, that could be an end that could help in that direction. This re array represents about two years of work, and so making it freely available would certainly <coughs> help in a variety of contexts, especially in the animal behavior community. I'm not. I'm using electric microphones. Does everyone? Oh, question again. So he asked, "What microphones am I using?" It's there's a company called Knowles. They produce microphones, especially those targeted at Im being implantable in your ear. There's a type of microphone called an electric microphone. If you don't know what it is, essentially one class of microphones is can be thought of as a capacitor. So two plates. They have a particular charge on them, or a voltage rather. Well, okay, a charge. And when, you, when there's a sound coming, the plates move in accordance with the sound, which causes a modulation of the voltage signal. An electric microphone is one that has a, a charge fixed on it. Usually when you have this capacitor set up, you actually have to put a very large voltage across, as in about 150 volts or so. Yeah, so it doesn't work in this context. We use the small implantable in your ear microphones because it makes the array much smaller. So, okay, I'll even answer that a bit more than you might have wanted. The, the microcontrollers that I said have four microphones coming off, it's actually just a long wire. It's a shielded cable. It goes to a preamplifier board that has the microphone. It's very small. You can just stick it on a wall. I didn't go into it, but there are techniques for finding out where the microphones are in a room, arbitrary placement. Uh, so when they're small microphones, they, they invade the sound field less. As a last note on that that wasn't asked for, but I didn't say this in the presentation, Ultrasonic sounds, high frequency sounds, are very directional. You can see this in the human hearing range. For example, when cars roll by and they have booming subwoofers, you can hear that everywhere. Annoyingly, maybe. But when you go up to the higher frequency, even in that sound, that song, the voices, they don't travel around walls. They don't invade your room. So that's, in the case of ultrasound, this microphone, the stem could block it. Block it. It had a fairly clear shadow acoustically, so. Sorry, but you're in. Yeah, okay. Thank you.